But I am thrilled that you're here this morning. Uh, today we have an opportunity to hear from Dr. George Wood. Dr. Wood is the former General Superintendent of the Assemblies of God in the United States. Um, if you are new to Christian Chapel or unfamiliar, we are a part of the Assemblies of God Fellowship. We enjoy uh, that relationship really for, for three primary reasons. First of all, it gives us accountability. Uh, we have oversight uh, above the local church level who is helping us make sure that we are um, in line with our practices and our beliefs. We love the uh, doctrinal emphasis of the Assemblies of God on the active work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And then we love the opportunity we have to partner with Assemblies of God missionaries who are working all around the world to advance the gospel. So it's been a, a long time uh, partnership between Christian Chapel and the Assemblies of God, one that we have loved and drawn from greatly. Dr. Wood has been a, an instrumental leader in our movement for many years. When I was in college in Springfield, he would come and speak in our chapel services. Over the years, I've heard him at different conferences and events. And so you know in life there are times where someone kind of mentors you from afar, even though you have absolutely uh, no personal relationship with them. This past fall, I was able to go on a Reformation tour in Germany, where we toured through some of the sites of Martin Luther's life and work. Dr. Wood was on that trip as well, and so it was a great opportunity for me to get to know someone that I had learned so much from and just found him to be uh, just a, a wonderful, kind, generous man. Uh, he shared so many stories um, on that trip with us about uh, his family's history of working with missions, and really kind of this, this idea kept coming up again and again in many of the stories that uh, your temporary investments really can have an eternal difference in God's kingdom. And so I knew we were going to be doing this Kingdom Builder stuff in January, and as soon as we got back, I emailed him and asked him if he would be available today, worked out for him to do that. In addition to uh, serving as the general superintendent, Dr. Wood serves as the global co-chair of Empower 21 with Dr. Wilson from Oral Roberts University. He serves as the chairman of the World Assemblies of God Fellowship, and he has, I think, probably six or seven other uh, jobs in retirement uh, that are keeping him as busy as when he was working full-time. He also serves on the President's uh, Faith Advisory Council, and so it's uh, comforting for us to know that uh, a man like Dr. Wood has a, a voice in our government trying to encourage our leaders to do things in ways that honor the Lord. So, Dr. Wood, if you will come, we would love to hear from you this morning. Thank you so much. I'd love to be able to leap in a single bound to the platform like the pastor, but I don't have his long legs and he's half my age, so what can you say? It's good to be here today, and I, I did have the joy of being with your pastor in uh, Germany uh, in, in September and got to know him, and now last night, to know Angie as well. God has blessed you with a wonderful pastor. He has indeed, and uh, so I'm, I'm just... Thrilled to be here. I have my wife of 52 years uh, with me today. Jewel, stand up so everybody can see who you are. We we're both 39 years of age and still holding, so that's that's great. You know, I got a uh, a letter one time uh, at uh, uh, at our national office, and it was it was a typo in the envelope. Instead of being addressed to the assemblies of God, it was addressed to the assemblies of good. Just an extra O in there. And I thought, yeah, I like that. We're both of God and of good. So that's, that's great. And uh, delighted to be with you on a Sunday in which you are giving focus to building the Lord's kingdom. Um, I'm going to, my, my theme today is uh, investing eternally. And it makes me think about the stock market in the last few months, last year. Actually, since when? Uh, last 2016, uh, the day after the election. I was talking to someone this week, and I said, why didn't I take my retirement savings and put it all in the stock market? That would have been so much better off. Jill, we could have gone on vacation this year. You know, I'm, I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, I missed a great opportunity. I didn't know. If you had if you'd known your 401k was going to go crazy in the last 12 months, you would have probably, you know, tried to invest in it. I didn't, didn't know that. But you know what? We have an opportunity to invest eternally to see eternal dividends in the kingdom of God, when we talk about building his kingdom. So that's where my heart really is, and I know that's where your heart is as well. So when the Bible was written, they didn't have a stock market. They didn't have the kind of economic devices we have today. So when the Bible talks about uh, the economy, it talks, 
within an agricultural context. And the word harvest is a frequent word that is used. In fact, the word harvest is used 96 times in the Bible, 24 of those times in the New Testament. And if we, uh, if pastor had given me three hours today, we'd walk through all 96 times. But now I'm just, uh, I want to walk through three principles of sowing and reaping that are themes within the harvest as we share together today, as we invest eternally in God's work. The first principle I want to share is we reap what we sow. The scripture verse for that is Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man, or for that matter, a woman, reaps what he or she sows. In other words, if you want to reap, you must sow. Over the course of the church year, probably you will hear some missionaries who come to you and give you a testimony of great results that are happening today in their field of endeavor. There may be others who come and are not able to give you a great report of hundreds or even dozens of people coming to Christ, but don't disregard them and don't diminish that don't diminish them because they are in a different stage of the harvest. There is a sowing stage and there is a reaping stage. A number of years ago, I had the opportunity of being a uh, retreat speaker for Wycliffe Bible translators in their Guatemala field. Guatemala was the first country that Wycliffe started in. They've now translated the Bible into hundreds of languages around the world. But they piloted everything in Guatemala because of the large number of mountainous, indigenous India people groups in Guatemala. One afternoon, I was being hosted for lunch by some veteran Wycliffe missionaries who at that point were ending their work in Guatemala after uh, uh, 30 years. I knew from others that in that 30 years, they had been able to not only translate the Bible, entire Bible, into the language of the largest indigenous people group, but they'd also created the orthography for the language because prior to them, the language had never had a written text. So here they are at the end of 30 years, and their work is done. I said to them, uh, tell me what it was like in the early days that you were here. And tears literally came to their eyes as they described moving into a village to try to, by language absorption, learn the language. But the witch doctor had uh, warned the people not to have anything to do with them. And so the only words they were picking up were the times they'd go to the marketplace, get a few words here and there. And they said, that finally, after two years, we had finally made a friend in the village, our first friend who would teach us the language. As they were saying this, I thought to myself, I don't know if I would want to live in a primitive village for two years with no one talking to me. And But they had. They said, at the same time we had made our first friend, we got a letter from our home church. It had a new pastor, and we were, we were wholly supported by our home church. And this new pastor was writing all the missionaries the church supported and said, under my leadership, the church is going to have a different direction in missions because I want our church to put our funds where they are having the greatest result. So I'm asking all of our missionaries to answer this one question, and on the basis of your answer, we will apportion our missionary dollar. The question was this, how many people have you won to the Lord this past year? They said, what could we say to this pastor? We finally had to write back and say, we have not won anyone to the Lord, but we have just made our first friend. Uh, the church cut off their support in its entirety because that pastor didn't understand the first law of investing, that if you're going to reap, you've got to sow. And they said to me, Ray and Helen Elliott said to me, you know, we almost uh, had to leave because our support had dried up, but some others heard about our need, began supporting us, we stayed. And now, not only do these people have the Bible in their own language, but there are scores of churches and there are thousands of believers in those churches scattered across the hillsides in Guatemala. They had sown, and as a result, there was a harvest. So I grew up in a family of sowers. My mother went as a single missionary to northwest China in the year 1924 when she was 26 years of age. Um, she served for about eight years. Uh, her first term came home. I turned ready to go back. And about six weeks, I think it was, before she set sail, she met a single uh, man who was going out to China for his very first term. 
something must have clicked on the boat going to Shanghai because when they got to Shanghai, they got married. And uh, dad was uh, 24 and mother was 34. Let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> but they were the only two of as God missionaries going to northwest China. Uh, and uh, you tend to marry who's near you. <laughs> Which explains why some of you are sitting next to who you are sitting next to. Uh, they sowed in that very hard soil of Qinghai province up about 8,000 feet above uh, sea level. And... Uh, they worked hard for the Lord. They didn't see a lot of results in their lifetime, but in a moment or two, I'll share the aftermath. They were sowers in God's vineyard. I, uh, I look back at the history of our own fellowship, uh, the Assemblies of God, and I marvel at the incredible growth that is taking place around the world today, but it happened because in years earlier, there was a generation of people who sowed. I, uh, I was especially interested to see what happened in the Assemblies of God in the 10 years of the Great Depression between 1929 and 1939. Because normally you would think that during Depression, the, the body of Christ would cut back and would conserve rather than expand. But here's the story. In 1929, and these figures will go up and you can see them, we had worldwide, in 1929, we were only 15 years of age at the time, we had 91,981 people. We've always counted, by the way. In the book of Acts, they counted people, so we count. There's a whole book in the Bible called Numbers, so we know, you know. It's... 91,981 people worshiping in 1,612 churches with 279 missionaries out across the world. Ten years later, at the close of the Great Depression, we had doubled in the number of people to 184,022 more than doubled the number of churches, 3,496 churches, and we had increased the number of missionaries from 279 to 350 during the Great Depression because that generation understood that the Great Depression had not canceled the Great Commission, go into all the world. As a result of that sowing, today, across the world in over 220 countries, provinces, and territories, there are over 68 million people worshiping in a Sum of God churches, 370,000 plus churches around the world today. Phenomenal what the Lord has done. But it happened because there have been people who have sowed and continued to sow. And it's been made possible because people like you have said, we're going to be partners in this. We're going to be partners locally and globally. We are going to be kingdom builders and if we are not the ones who cross oceans, languages, cultures, and national boundaries with the gospel, we're going to commit to sending those who are called to do so. When I was pastor, I was explaining the whole concept of being a kingdom builder, or what we also have called faith promises. And since I tend to think visually, I thought of a three-layer chocolate cake, my very favorite dessert with some wonderful vanilla bean ice cream on top of it. But we'll just show you the picture of the, of the chocolate cake. And the chocolate cake has three layers. And I, I think of my giving uh, for uh, local and global missions in terms of that chocolate cake. The first layer of the cake is what I call discretionary. It's, um, it's the, when I empty my pockets at night and put the money, change or whatever out on the counter, if my wife manages to take some of that, you know, it's, hey, it's what I spend for a Starbucks or a newspaper, it's okay. Uh, it's discretionary uh, income. It, it'd be amazing to see the advance of the kingdom if every single believer in Jesus Christ would just use discretionary income for the sake of the kingdom. That's level one. Level two is what I call sacrifice. Sacrifice in an American context for me is, am I willing to alter my lifestyle to advance the gospel? It may be in the kind of choices I make for purchases or whatever, but do I alter my lifestyle in any way so that God's kingdom can be advanced? And the third level of the cake is what I call faith. It's, I don't know, Lord, where this is coming from, but when I make the commitment, I'm going to ask that above my discretionary, above my willingness to alter my lifestyle, I'm going to trust you to put this in my hands to give this next year. I was explaining this three-layer chocolate cake when I was pastor in California, and 
And there was a family that had come to the Lord that year, uh, and they, it was their first time they'd ever heard about missions. And, and I'm talking about the three layer chocolate cake and, uh, how even if you don't have discretionary income and you don't, you, and you don't have sacrificial income to give, you, we can all give on the basis of faith. And I said, everyone, including young people, should also make this commitment because uh, everybody knows young people have money. The clothing industry knows, the electronics industry knows, the entertainment industry knows. So I said, even young people should do this. Well, I didn't know until the following Sunday when 13-year-old Becky was dragged up to meet me by her mother, Beth, after the service. And uh, Beth said, uh, Pastor, uh, you know, last Sunday uh, when you made that comment about the uh, level of faith I, and everybody should give, I, I looked over at Becky and she took the card and she wrote down $5 a month. She said, uh, Pastor, uh, Becky never sees $5 a month. She doesn't have a job and, she, and she, we don't give our children an allowance. And said, I almost stopped her because, because that was just too much, you know, $5 a month. I didn't want her to be disappointed if it didn't happen. She said, but I, I felt checked. Maybe I should let her exercise faith. And of course, I'm thinking immediately, oh, she jumped to the third layer of the cake because all of us have the third layer of the cake. And, and then she said, but pastor, here's the incredible story. And she said, you're not going to believe this, but this actually happened. She said, Becky on Tuesday was walking along the beach. And we were in Southern California, walking along the beach. And, and she was with some of her junior high friends and she saw a fleck of something out in the water and she decided to, uh, uh, she felt an impulse, go pick that up. And she wanted, she didn't want to get wet. She didn't want to go out. But about the third time she felt the impulse, she waded out of the surf and picked up the edge of what was floating. It was literally an edge to a $5 bill. Her first month's promise floating in on a wave. And she, and Becky was just smiling. She was so happy. She was so giddy at this story. And I, I thought, oh, wow. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that when you make your commitment to Kingdom Builders next week, you head for California and walk the surf. It's the only time in human history I know that that, that ever happened. But the point simply was this. She exercised faith. And if you don't exercise faith, your faith muscles atrophy. She exercised faith and that became her commitment. Then she got babysitting jobs the rest of the year, and that's how she made her commitment. But uh, we all can be sowers in the work of the Lord. That's the first principle. If we're going to reap, we must sow. The second principle is simply this. We reap, we, we, we reap more than we sow. So Jesus says, still some seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. We read more than we sow. We're certainly seeing that around the world. I, up on the screen, you will see uh, this. I have a copy of it in my hand. This actually was a much larger size poster that hung on a Summers of God church walls in uh, 1939 for missions conventions. This, so this is older than I am, okay, just to make that clear. Uh, well, a couple of years older anyway. Uh, it has it has a map of the continent of Africa, and all around it are all the missionaries we had serving in Africa at the time. Uh, these were the generation of sowers. Interestingly, at the bottom of Africa, it has some of the stats. I'll just point out two. It talks about the number of mission stations and outstations. Today, we would call those churches and preaching points. There are 125 of them all together, and there are 13,000 believers in those 125 churches and preaching points. That's 1939. So, where are we uh, today? Today we no longer have 125 churches and preaching points in the continent of Africa. We have 81,678 churches in Africa. We no longer have 113,000 believers. Uh, we have instead 22,605,565 believers in the continent of Africa. Do you read more than you sow? Absolutely. I think of uh, Pastor Meng, whom I, whom I knew. Pastor Meng was pastor in Xining, Northwest China, a church that my parents uh, helped to found. Uh, our last Sunday in uh, Xining, Qinghai province, near the border of Tibet, in 1949, Pastor Meng was then 41 years of age. He was my dad's age at the time. He preached the last sermon that, we, that was given the last Sunday 
We were in Xining before we fled, before the communists take over of that part of China. We did, I did not see Pastor Meng again for 39 years until 1988. My parents longed to go back to see the believers there, but never had that opportunity. In fact, not only did they not return, but there never was a word or a letter that came out it was, of course, in the days long before the Internet, there was no communication at all ever came out of Xining, where my parents had labored for so many years to plant the work of the Lord. And um, my mom died 30 years after we left. My dad died 35 years after we left. They never knew the rest of the story. I got back in 1988 when Pastor Mung was 80 years of age. I'll never forget meeting him on the church grounds uh, and uh, and getting caught up on the story of what had happened. Make a long story short, several years after we left, the church property was confiscated. Pastor Mung was sent to prison. He would spend the next nine years in prison. I asked him what they fed him those years in prison, and he smiled real big, and he said, mostly spoiled food. And I thought, boy, if I'd eaten spoiled food in a Chinese prison for nine years, I don't know if I'd be smiling. But he was. He said, after they let me out of prison, I was on probation for 16 more years, I was not allowed to preach. Property of the church had been given to others. We were not allowed to meet. He said, I would go secretly to homes to strengthen believers. That was all I could do. He said, finally, when I was 72 years of age, the local authorities called me in. And they said that during the Cultural Revolution, their mistakes had been made, and my case was one of them. And they wanted to apologize to me and give me my official papers of exoneration. He said, I looked across the room at those party officials, and I said to them, you took away the best 25 years of my life, and all you think you have to do is apologize? And I thought, that's rather bold. And, and they made a mistake of saying to him, what, what do you want us to do for you? He said, number one, I want to preach the gospel again. Number two, I want the church property returned. Number three, I want my granddaughter to have permission to come and live with us. And take care of us, we are now utterly. And number four, all these years you've deprived me of income. You should pay me money or a pension. They conferred and gave him everything he asked for. But when they returned the church property to him, they only gave him legal possession, not actual possession. This is akin to somebody stealing your car. You still are the legal owner. You just don't use it anymore. And you don't use self-help techniques to repossess because that can be very dangerous. But they offered no help to repossess the property. He came to the property, tried to get the people off the property, the government to give it to him, and they beat him up. He said, it took me three years to get them off the property. Finally said, I was able to secure the property again, and we had our first service. I said to him, Pastor Mung, uh, he was at that time then 75. I said, Pastor Mung, how many people did you have that first Sunday? And he said, uh, 30. And my heart dropped because at one time, the total Christian community of three different denominations in Xining had been 500, and now it was down to one church, 30 people. I said, uh, mostly from my parents' ministry. He said, yes. He said, mostly from your parents' ministry. But I thought, wow, they're probably all old like he is. And so I asked him the next question. I said, um, well, how many... How many believers uh, do you have now? And I thought he would. I thought he would say twenty. You know, ten have died. Uh, this is <laughs> this is God's man of faith and power right here. So, so he said, "Would you like to see our baptismal roster?" And I thought, "Roster? They got a roster? You know, must have baptized two or three people before they died. You know, kind of fire insurance." But uh, so his little wife. They lived in a room off the platform. His little wife. Goes, she gets, she gets it's about half the size of my Bible, in turn, and it was, it was a cardboard cover front and back with white crinkly linen paper, kind of linen-like paper in between. I opened it, and it was columned. It had five columns. It had name, age, gender, a, uh, address, and occupation, and it was, it was about eighteen to twenty names. Now, the significance of this is that he was not legally and did not baptize anyone under the age of 18 because that was illegal. It was illegal for them to have youth services or Sunday school or any indoctrination for the young because that was also illegal. And it also was mandatory that everyone that was baptized, their name and address was turned over to the local religious affairs bureau so they could be harassed and discriminated against. So how many people, you know, so 18, 20 names, I thought, 
they ain't really done great. I, I just happened to turn the next page, and it too was full of writing, full of names. Third page, full of writing. Fourth page, page after page after page after page after page after page after page. I, I, chills began running up and down my back because I thought, wow, I am holding what the book of Revelation calls the Lamb's Book of Life, only it's of Xining, my old hometown. I finally closed the, the baptismal roster and I handed it again to Pastor Mung and I said, Pastor Mung, how many believers do you have now? He said, we have 1,500 adult baptized believers. And I said to him, how did this happen? He looked at me like I'd asked an American question. Like, what, what seminar did you go to? What book did you read? I'll never forget his answer. He said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we pray a lot. And they went on to describe what the Lord had done in that town, including a Communist Party, one of the leading Communist Party's officials' wife was sent home from the hospital to die of cancer. They secretly called for Pastor Mung. He laid hands on her, prayed for her, and God healed her. When he died at the age of 96... There were 15,000 believers in that town and three major churches. I had the privilege of being the first non-Chinese person to preach in that church since 1949. It was packed. It was wall-to-wall. No, they weren't worried about fire code. There, was no, there were no aisles. It was just people, wall-to-wall, front-to-back, up at the balcony. And I, I'll just, I just the emotion that came over me as those people prayed, as they interceded, uh, and I, I, I thought of something my mother used to say to me when I was a little red-headed boy in that town. Yes, I had red hair. It's coming back in the resurrection. I do, do hope. <laughs> uh, but I'd be upset about something, and she, she would say, now, now, Georgie, that's my family, and now, Georgie, it won't matter 100 years from now. And really, there are a lot of things that will not matter 100 years from now. What kind of car you drive, what kind of house you live in, what kind of clothes you wear. What matters 100 years from now is did you love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and did you love others as Jesus loved them? And uh, so, you know, you're, I've, I've seen in China that you reap more than you sow. I, and I might just put in a word here, although I don't have a picture to go with this, but I, I noticed that you're coming up on the 20th anniversary of having Royal Family Kids Camp in this church. Royal Family Kids Camp started in the church I pastored in California when I was pastor in the year 1985. Wayne Tesh, who was associate pastor with me, he came to me one day and he said, you know, George, we got a lot of uh, foster parents in this church and I've, I've noticed that there's never an opportunity for kids to go up in the mountains, foster kids to go up in the mountains and give the, parent, give the foster parents a break and also to give these foster kids, many of whom have been so abused and neglected, give them a great time for a week, a week to change their life. He said, you think we could do it? And he said, I've talked with the Orange County Social Services and they said they'd give us names. And I said, well, how much will it cost? He said, it cost about $5,000. Well, at the time, that was pretty much our weekly income. But I said, you know, if our people will give it, let's do it. And sure enough, our people did. And I'll never forget that first sunny night when the workers that were going to go up the mountains, because you had to have a, 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 a one child, uh, two child, one adult per every two children, more intensive because of the nature of what's happened to these foster kids. And that, that first... Uh, that, that first contingent of workers came forward on Sunday night for a consecration prayer. As we were all at the front praying, someone uh, began to, what I thought at the moment, I thought they were prophesying, which just shows how ignorant I was of the Scripture, uh, because they were actually reading Isaiah chapter 58, which says, If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with a, malicious, with a pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land, will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. And then this great line, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins. Foster kids know what it is to have ruin in their life. You'll rebuild the ancient ruins and raise up the age-old foundations, you will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. Those 37 kids that first year have now, 33 years later, 
have over 100,000 kids that have gone through royal family. And to hear the testimonies of some of these kids who are now adults is an amazing experience, how one week can change a child's life. I salute you as a church family for having a heart for kids that have been broken, for foster kids, and for being involved in royal family, because you, too, are reaping more than has been sown. We could have never seen in 1985 that royal family would not be just a one-time experience, but would become hundreds of camps throughout the world that would involve over 100,000 kids. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 reminds us to not be cheap with the seed. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So we reap what we sow, we reap more than we sow. The third thing we know about the harvest is we reap later than we sow. So the Apostle Paul says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, or God's time, we will reap at a harvest we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. In other words, there's a tension between sowing and reaping, between the time when the seed is put in the ground and when there is a harvest. It's the same way when as kingdom builders we make a commitment. We don't see the immediate results of that. You may in your lifetime never see what you do in making a commitment for kingdom builders, how it over the course of time transitions from something that is financial into something that brings salvation and spiritual health and wholeness to persons whom you will never meet this side of heaven. In other words, there is this tension between the time of sowing and the time of reaping. And I've seen enough examples of that to uh, just stagger one. I, I'll just mention a couple of my uncles. Uh, one I don't have a picture of, but the other one I'll, I'll show a picture. Um, my uncle Victor Plymeyer went as a pioneer missionary to northwest China and Tibet in the year 1908. After serving about 11 years, he came home, married his fiancée, who had been his fiancée all those 11 years by letter. Took three months to get a letter through. There were no phone calls in those days. Up on the China-Tibetan border in Huang Yan. Uh, married Grace. A year later in America, they had a little boy, John David. Brought that little baby to northwest China. Came back to Huang Yan. Um, that first winter, it's 9,000 feet altitude. Very cold. A Tibetan rented them two rooms with dirt floor. They had no fresh vegetables, no uh, fresh fruit. Uh, they, uh, they lived in that dank atmosphere for that winter. And when spring came, my uncle said to his wife, Grace, you know, if we're going to stay here, we got to have a regular place, but we only have $50 a month in support. And I, don't, I found a piece of property. I, we can build a chapel. We can build a house behind it, but, uh, but it's going to take about $5,000, which in the year 1921 was a lot of money, still is. Uh, and uh, Grace said, you know, said, but I received an inheritance of $5,000 before we were married, and, and I want to, you know, I want to give that. He said, no, you, you, can't, you can't give your inheritance. You, I, I won't let you do that. She said to him, how can we say we love the lost of this town if we're not willing to give everything? So they took that money and built the buildings that stand to this day, both the chapel and the church. And, uh, you know, in America, we have a view that if you do something nice for the Lord, then he does twice as nice back to you, okay? Uh, but that doesn't always happen. And when uh, little John David was six years of age, a smallpox epidemic hit that town, and he came down with smallpox. A week later, Grace came down with smallpox. And um, little John David died first, died saying, Jesus is coming for me. And Uncle Victor uh, took, uh, b dug a shallow grave in the courtyard between the church and the house so that his wife could be a witness to the funeral. And then a week later, she died in his arms. In one week, he'd lost his wife and his child. Tried to get permission for the town to let them be buried in the city cemetery, but they wouldn't give him permission. So he finally bought a piece of ground out outside of town on a hillside overlooking a Tibetan valley. And he buried them there. It was January, bitter cold. Had the ground was frozen so solid he only dug one grave, put both caskets, the small casket on top of the big one, down in the ground. And uh, lived through that tough winter. 
when May came, he determined, uh, spring had come, that he would go through Tibet, and he had 100,000 copies of the Gospel of John printed, and he put them on pack animals and started out uh, crossing Tibet on foot from China to India. He'd become the first non-Chinese, non-Tibetan to ever do this. It took him nine months. On the afternoon before he set out, he went to the gravesite, which all for many years was only marked by a mound of dirt. He went to the gravesite and he wrote this in his journal. Till the furthest nook and corner of Tibet has heard the gospel, my work is not done. Until every last man, woman, and child has heard the story of redemption through Christ, my task is not finished. Nine months later, after missing death twice by miraculous divine intervention, he reaches India. Instead of coming back to the U.S., he circles back, comes back through China. A year later, meets my mother and her single sister in Beijing, courts and marries uh, my mother's sister, my Aunt Ruth. They come back to Wang Yan, and that's where they would serve until the communists came in 1949. Plymeyer's, Uncle Victor Plymeyer and our family left the same time that part of the world. We were only 30 miles apart. Plymeyer's also never heard what happened to their work until my cousin David, their son, and I got back in in the late 1980s. I've been back six times altogether. And what had happened was when we first went back in, the property of the Huang Yan Church had also been confiscated by the government. And Pastor Chin, who was the son of the martyred Pastor Chin, had said to my cousin, you know, we don't have any proof that the government knows that your dad built this property, bought this property, but they're playing mind games with us. They won't let us have it back. Does your father, did your father ever have any proof of purchase? And my, my cousin said, I don't know. He said, I, when I go home, I'll look at my father's papers. And in my uncle's file at our Division of World Missions, my cousin found a document that was a deed. But it was not a deed to the church. It was a deed to the grave out on the edge of town. And the property to that grave was not vested in my uncle's name, although it was his personal grave. It was vested in the name of the church, the Gospel Hall of the Assemblies of God, Huang Yan. My cousin took that deed back to Pastor Chin. Pastor Chin took it to the authorities and said, here is proof we exist. We own a gravesite in this town. And on the strength of that deed, 64 years after John David and Grace died, 64 years later, the property gets returned to the church and it reopens. You reap later than you sow. And uh, it was interesting, because of our involvement with that town over the years and bringing humanitarian assistance and the like, we began to see favor that was given and... Uh, one of the most touching things was the uh, Communist Party officials of that town came to my cousin and said, you know, the hillside is eroding where the graves are, and we think that we ought to give you and the Christians in Huang Yan a new cemetery, and we would like to disinter the caskets and to, and to bring them to the new cemetery. The day came when they started digging. They got six foot down, and there was no casket. And my cousin was worried as to, what, did my dad really bury them here? But he encouraged them to keep digging at nine feet down. I, because my uncle was so afraid of grave robbers, at nine feet down they found both caskets. And they brought them to a new cemetery. And to our surprise, the town fathers, who are not believers, had erected a gravestone. The grave had never had a gravestone. A beautiful monument. It must have weighed a ton. And in Chinese and English it had their names and it also had scripture. Can you believe that Communist Party officials put in that scripture, I am the resurrection and the life? You read for later than you sow. The picture that you have is my other uncle in, in uh, Burkina Faso. Uh, uncle Paul, my mother's younger brother, went to Africa. My mother went to China. Her sister went to China. Their younger brother went to Africa in the mid-1930s during the Great Depression. They were... They were uh, a missionary uh, who, whose picture is, uh, is right here on this poster I showed you earlier. They had with them Paul Jr., and, uh, who was five, and, and Johnny, who was three. Johnny is sitting next to his mother with the accordion in my Aunt Virginia, and Uncle Paul, Paul Jr. is standing beside him. They're under a baobab tree, and my, uh, this painting is hung on my office wall. It's one of my favorite 
things to look at it because it reminds me of commitment. Paul Jr., my cousin, is translating for his dad because between the ages of five and six, he had learned the Mosi language so fluently that when Uncle Paul would go out to the village to preach, Uncle Paul would preach in English and little Paul would translate for him. And uh, at the age of seven, though, Paul Jr. came down with Blackwater fever and within a few days passed away. In his dying delirium, he sang Mosi hymns and he preached in the Mosi language. And his dying words in Mosi, a little boy preaching in a delirium, were, Do not follow Satan's road. Follow Jesus' road. It's the road that leads to heaven. I had the privilege of preaching the 75th anniversary of the Summons of God in Burkina Faso, which now numbers about a million people in a country of 16 million. There were 100,000 people in the closing rally. The president of the country came, sat in the front row, members of his government. And I told the story as I began my sermon of the death of my cousin. And I segued by saying, in the unique providence of God, I have the opportunity to finish the sermon which my cousin began with his dying words 60 years ago. Don't follow Satan's road. Follow Jesus' road. It's the road that leads to heaven. So it was just an incredible moment. But the thing that I remember most about that occasion was they had selected a little old lady to sing a song of tribute to the American missionaries who were present and to the American church. She was not chosen because she had a beautiful voice. In fact, her voice was very ragged, and she had a little drum in the crook of her arm. And she, in sing-song fashion, she had been chosen because she had the ability, the African ability, to tell an oral history. And in her oral history, she wove the name of every, some has got missionary or family member that had died in their country. About two dozen, some has got missionaries and family members had died in their country of diseases for which there was no immunization. It was a very moving moment. I'm sitting in the front row next to my cousin who's translating for me as she is singing. I got every word of it. Let me just give you an extract. I could never imitate her voice, but it was in a sing-song fashion. It went something like this. I thank you for what you did for us yesterday, she's saying to the American church. Mzami, yay, 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 yay. Before coming, they knew we had snakes and scorpions. Mzami, yay, 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 yay. They preached in spite of hardship. They preached. We listened. They built us up in the faith. Some of them are buried in our land here, never to see home again. We will never forget them, and we love them. They came. They came. They helped us. They taught us. And we listened, and we will never forget them. When she was done, tears were streaming down my face, and I said, to my cousin, I wish every American Christian could hear the gratitude of people who did not know God until these missionaries were sent. They would never regret anything they'd ever done to send these missionaries that brought the gospel to these wonderful people. Song of gratitude. I wish I could bring every American Christian here. They would never be neutral about missions again if they could just hear the gratitude of the African church. But I said to him, you know, there's this phrase she kept using that, uh, that you didn't translate. And he said, what's that? And I said, it, it's this phrase, emzamiye, ye, ye, ye. He said, what, what is that? He said, oh, he said, I, I, thought, I thought you'd already picked that up. He said, it translates, it just, it, it, it says, we just want to thank you. We just want to thank you. So, Using that little lady's word on behalf of all the people will be reached because you choose to be kingdom builders. I will say to you as I close on their behalf, Mzama, yay, yay, yay. Thank you, and God bless you richly. Thank you, Dr. Wood. Uh, I wish we had a couple more hours. He could, I mean, Dr. Wood is a repository of stories of God's goodness and God's grace and how our small investments uh, make a difference in ways that those stories are told long after we're gone. Not because of who we are, but because they're stories of God's kingdom and God's blessing. The ushers are going to come uh, here in just a moment and they're going to pass out these kingdom builders cards to you. 
And we are not receiving these today, but instead what I want you to do is take this home with you this week. If you're married, spend some time talking with your spouse about it and consider how you can be part of building God's kingdom um, around the world in Tulsa and in the next generation. Next Sunday morning, uh, I'll spend some time explaining why we have shifted to this kingdom builders model of giving as opposed to our old faith promise model. Um, basically, it, it kind of boils down to we were asking the Lord, how can we do more? How can we be a greater part of what you're doing in the world, what you're doing in our community, and what you're doing in the lives of children and teenagers? And we feel like he kind of uh, just led us to this idea. So we're going to walk through that next week. Kingdom Builders basically has three buckets to it. Global missions, local ministry, and next generation investment. Our 2018 Kingdom Builders goal is $300,000. Uh, We're believing that as God provides for us, we're going to be able to give that away to all sorts of ministries outside of Christian Chapel who are working to advance the gospel. That includes the continued support of the over 50 missionaries and ministries that we support on a monthly basis working all over the world. Uh, So if you guys want to go ahead and start passing those out, if you want to grab that, take it home with you this week as you're praying, I want you to have 2 Corinthians 9 in mind where the Apostle Paul says, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each one of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So this week, take some time to pray about how God will have you be part of helping us meet that $300,000 goal this year. My encouragement to you is uh, don't do the math, right? Don't go home and think, okay, Christian Chapel, 400 people, uh, fourth of those are kids, so we all have to give X amount of dollars to meet this goal. Don't do that. Instead, just ask the Lord, what do you want me to give? Over and above my regular discipline giving, What can I invest? And and think of those three levels Dr. Wood talked to us about. There's discretionary giving. Some of us just out of our excess funds, there is more we can give this year. There's sacrificial giving. For some of us, God might call us to uh, forgo that new car, to give something up and able to invest that in the kingdom. And then for many of us, I'm praying this will be a year of faith-filled giving where God puts a number, an amount in your heart. You think, "I, I don't know where that's coming from. My encouragement to you this week is to trust him. My faith has grown more through obeying God than it has through disobeying God, right? I mean, that seems like kind of common sense for all of us, that when he calls us to do something, as we obey and follow him, he provides and our faith expands. And so we want to be part of that. But this morning, uh, we just want to finish and have the band lead us in a song that reminds us what God promises, God does. And I want this song to resonate in your heart this week, that what he's calling you to do He's going to provide a way for you to do it. So we stand with us and sing with us. I will raise any promises of confidence.